That's five seconds gone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shruti, and I'm here to talk to you about the importance of an accurate measurement of time. The importance of time measurement was understood by human beings as early as 1500 BC when the Egyptians built the sundial clock. Since then, we've made rapid progress. All of you may have seen the grandfather clock or the pendulum clock, the quartz clock or the wall clock, and then now we are in the era of an atomic clock. So are clocks the fastest growing technology ever? Well, we've made steady improvements to the accuracy of clock over the years. But the biggest improvement has come in the last two decades or so, almost a million fold improvement in the accuracy of clocks. This time period, the last 20 years or so, has also seen the biggest growth in technologies such as satellite navigation, communication, et cetera. So is this overlap a coincidence? Well, the quest for greater accuracy of clocks has always been driven by technological advancement. A lot of you here may have used global positioning system or GPS. So how does a GPS work? A GPS works by relaying information about your current position to a satellite that's navigating the Earth somewhere above. And it relays this information at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. So because this information relaying process is so fast, even an inaccuracy in time measurement by one microsecond means 300,000 kilometers per second times one microsecond is still a pretty big number. It's 300 meters. So what are the implications of 300 meters? Imagine you agree to meet your friend on, on the north side of Lakeville for lunch. You could end up on the south side of Lakeville just because your GPS was running off of a clock that was inaccurate by one microsecond. So we've always sought to improve the clock. But how do we improve the accuracy of a clock? We improve the accuracy of a clock by looking at the different parts of a clock. All clocks have a few parts in common. You need something that periodically moves or oscillates. It could be the Earth moving around the sun, it could be a pendulum, or it could be a quartz oscillator. Things that move cannot keep moving by themselves. You need a source to drive them. It could be gravity, or it could be a battery. And then finally, you, the most important thing is you need something that can count. The sundial, the hands of the clock, some kind of electronic counters, they're all some examples. The big leap in clock technology came because all of these conventional parts were replaced with things far more reliable and identical. In an atomic clock, as the name suggests, the thing that moves periodically is an atom. And what drives the atom? It's light. And we don't directly sit and count the number of times it oscillates, but rather we detect frequencies of atomic transitions. What does this mean? I'll get to in a while. But before that, what makes atoms so special? Atoms are the same everywhere. A cesium atom, which is what sits in an atomic clock, is the same in Chicago. A cesium atom is the same in New York, is the same in London, is the same in Berlin, it's the same everywhere. Quantum mechanics tells us this, that atoms have energy levels. These are discrete, and they're stacked up one above the other. So what happens when you shine light on an atom? If the energy of the light that you shine is equal to the difference in the energy between two levels, the atom can actually absorb the light that you shine and go to a higher level. But it doesn't stay there forever. It falls down. But it does this again and again and again. It, in fact, does this 10 billion times per second, or equivalently, 10 to the 10 hertz. This number, 10 to the 10 hertz, is what is called the frequency of this transition. The bottom line is, the greater is the number of times the periodic event occurs, the lesser is the error, and more is the accuracy of the clock. But this is easier said than done. Atoms are finicky little things that keep jumping, moving, and running around everywhere. And so we have traps that literally trap these atoms and confine them to a small region. But that's still not enough. They still keep jiggling and wiggling in this small region. So in order to arrest their motion, we cool them down to really low temperatures. What you see here is a bunch of atoms which are cooled down to really low temperatures, minus 273 degrees Celsius. You really cannot go lower than that. Did you think this was cool? Well, this was 40 years ago. 
So what are we doing now? Well, we are actually dealing with molecules. Now what's molecules? In the simplest terms, you could think of molecules as two atoms joined by a stick. But that's where the problem comes. Molecules also have the same discrete levels that atoms have. But atoms just have very simple levels. But molecules have levels. And then there are sublevels. There are sub-sublevels, and probably even sub-sub-sub-sublevels. This means if you shine light on an atom or a molecule, it's going to jump up to the next state. But while an atom is going to decay down, the molecule can go to so many different levels and sublevels and sub sub levels. That means controlling a molecule is way harder than controlling an atom. What does this mean? I showed you a picture of a bunch of atoms trapped and cooled a while ago. But the equivalent picture for a molecule doesn't exist yet. This is a story that awaits success very soon. But why are we working so hard? The reason is, Clocks do more than just tell time. They can help us discover physics beyond what we know. All the physics that we know today assumes that certain numbers, certain fundamental numbers, do not change with time. They are the same today. They are the same tomorrow. They are the same 10,000 years later. However, there is some inadequacies in our understanding today. And some of these inadequacies can be resolved if we assume that these fundamental numbers are no longer constant. One such fundamental number is mu, which is the ratio of the mass of a proton and an electron. So how are we going to do this? Well, I told you that there's transition frequencies that we can measure. Now, this fundamental number turns out the atoms are not very sensitive to this. So even if this number were to change with time, the transition frequency of an atom, which is the number of times the atom goes up and down, will not change as much. However, this is where the molecules come in. Molecules are very sensitive to this number. So a change in this number over time means that we will measure a change in the frequency of transition of a molecule. Basically, it's pretty simple. You go measure this frequency today, and go and measure this frequency again tomorrow as accurately as you can, and see if you can figure out if this frequency has changed in time. And if it has, then it can tell us that these fundamental numbers that we think of as constants are probably no longer constant. In conclusion, there's more to time than you ever knew. The implications for accurate measurement of time can be seen in both technological advancement as well as an enhancement in our scientific understanding. And both are equally worthy goals in their own right. Thank you for your attention.